my presentation is going to be a bit, uh, a bit different. I try to uh, extract uh, what I should do for this talk um, or what topic I should pick out of our diverse um, uh, group of topics that we, we are engaged in, then I thought maybe I can come in with something in between computer vision and uh, data science. And the, and the topic that I can relate to a matter which is of a high, highly important for us in this country, and I'm sure it is even more important in other countries. So I'm going to talk to you about an infrastructure that we've been, we've been playing with this idea for a number of years. Uh, we've developed different types of prototypes, but I must admit that we don't have a fully implementing, implemented product in-house because it is so ambitious, this project. This year, uh, I worked on a proposal that I was getting ready to submit to NSF Big Data. And uh, I don't know, you guys may have already heard that NSF is discontinued, that program is not doing it. So probably then I thought maybe I can even talk a little bit from what was going in that. Um, archival Big Data Extraction, Assessment, and Preservation. That reminds us of all the documents, documents of written in this country, um, history is about, what, two, 250, 300 years old, and maybe if you go to China, they become a few thousand years old. Uh, but it is really, for us, uh, in this, in this uh, country, even 200, 300 years old handwritten documents, 100 years old, handwritten documents, they are becoming uh, almost what we call uh, forgotten data. What is inside them is not accessible in a, in a big data fashion. Uh, that's basically the topic of this uh, presentation is going to be about. Why we do this, why we are developing this idea, I'm going to quickly go through these. Um, it is the way to strengthen research and education uh, and pres preserve uh, and uh, increase the availability of cultural intellectual resources, enhance classroom teaching. These are pretty much what you expect from doing research. But I'm going to skip over these and get on to the infrastructure. This is what we envisioned. We've been doing pieces of this throughout the years. And archival data is not the only topic that we want to fit in this. I, we do medical imaging. We have an extremely difficult project on hand. I didn't include a slide there, but I noticed some of you are interested in medical imaging. Those of you can join us or help us on, uh, on, on dealing with MRI imaging where there are two muscles connected to, together and there's no boundary in between them visible. How can we identify that boundary? But knowing that these muscles are moving in a different, uh, differently, can we map the displacement of these muscles back into color intensity and develop them? And we've done several projects in this type. And the reason I brought this up is that I've been observing some of the talks and some of the talking to few people, and I noticed there are interest in, the, in this area. But all fits into this. But I'm, today I'm going to mostly focus on, um, on, on, on big data uh, 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 
our archival focus on that because not only it is a computer big data problem, not only it, it is the computer vision and the image processing is highly involved in that, but it is of high importance for our society where we need to be able to learn from these documents and, uh, and, uh, and, and work with them. The documents are currently scanned into the hard drives and they are meta tagged. And if you want to read them, you have to pull them up one by one and read them. And I'll talk to you about some other approaches that is, is going on. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing in this por portion of this infrastructure where STEM researchers that's led by computer science faculty mostly uh, will be developing, benchmarking, and working on different types of algorithms. And, uh, and non-STEM researchers are going to use those algorithms and generate the results or data that is going to be used by STEM researchers to enhance their methodologies. This is an excellent partnership. And the reason we want to do this, you're going to notice processing archival data is such a complex problem. There is no way one can claim that there is a 100% working operational system that you scan the documents into machine and it generates the, it, 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 the, it transcribes that document. That doesn't, that's not going to happen, um, at least for a while. What I want to see is can we put a partnership together where researchers from both angles can work and enhance work and enhance iteratively develop this further. And these are some interesting research that some of them which we are involved in and uh, I'm not going to spend more time on these uh, until we get here. Now this is the, what I was going to put in the proposal. We don't have this in-house. This is a uh, this is an uh, Amazon Web Services that they agreed to work with us, and they were actually providing this service for us if the, if the grant went through. So, but, this, but versions, reduced versions, we played with this um, in-house, but it's, it's not really a big uh, or what you call it an invention, we want to have an um, uh, infrastructure where different organizations, different people from different corners of the world, or I mean the country right now, can use the methodologies, algorithms seamlessly and uh, turn them to other users, for example, historians and others, can use those methodologies and generate the data where the data can be used by the other side to enhance their methodologies. Um, it is a big data problem, and these are the overlap in, 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 in disciplines and so on that we believe and it is currently uh, interested in these, and uh, and of course machine um, uh, computer vision. I'm going to be more focused on computer vision aspects of this, and then um, then of course other areas are going to be uh, playing a big role. This is a sample handwritten document, uh, although it is preserved well although it is written well, but I challenge some of us uh, to be able to read uh, hold this document, except maybe you can pick up a few words from this. It's not, they used to write differently. They, even the document is preserved well, but the writing, the style of writing 
is something that is not commonly used now. What I'm worried about is that if we don't do anything about this, if the experts that they know they're good in this type of writing, and as we get all age and old and, the, and we step aside, then there's going to be disconnect there. And this applies, by the way, this applies in even more in Europe. Um, they have much deeper history, and I'm sure they are, or China or other countries are even more, this, this, this problem is applicable. If we don't take advantage of those experts, eventually disconnect is, is going to happen and there's nothing else we can do about it. Um, this is an example of, this one, by the way, was included in one of my previous proposals. Uh, this is an example of a document um, I was working with at the time was from Marine History Faculty. And his interest was how can we automate the process as such that out of many documents, we can ask a question and the answer will be returned to us, not by someone reading, spending whole months to read it line by line to do it. And the question could be, it's not very readable there, and it is, I put it in the next slide. And the, the question is, how many uh, out of these documents that faculty member, historian, was interested, how many ships during the Civil War did Confederate mines sink? That's an interesting question. How can you answer this? Either you have to employ someone who understands these type of writing, who understand the marine history, and go in there and read them and they come back and with some answers. What we want to do is can we use our technology to answer these questions? And then I'm going to talk about up to a few years ago. This was almost actually one of the agencies that I submitted the proposal, they, they liked it very much and they said, this was about seven, eight years ago, and they said, look, it's not possible. You cannot do it. But I think, but, but they were more on a product um, uh, oriented people. They wanted readily or something that can be, uh, produce results. They were not interested to give opportunity for researchers to enhance their capabilities. But that they were correct. It was not possible. But I think we are getting close to solve this where our technology, now everyone is talking about machine learning. Machine learning, I mean, although it's a new word and fancy word for it, when we know it is belongs to maybe 30 years ago. We used to do this a long time ago in these type of things. But, it is, but what is making machine learning become more um, useful is the hardware. Machines themselves have become so powerful and they are able to accommodate or handle such iterative, iterative uh, based al uh, algorithms and the working with. Um, this is a sample uh, not well-preserved document. What can you do with it? Now, I'm not saying that we should have a system to prescribe. What I'm after is how can I make, create an excuse for a researchers to conduct for example, machine vision, computer vision research. This is excellent. This document you see here, deteriorated document, is an excellent, for me, is opportunity. For others, maybe is a lost document. We use machine learning. I've done a project where we were trying to 
create this topographical system long time ago where the ridges and the valleys, they were becoming so deep or so steep where we were using triangulation and the triangulation was using the shortest path in between the two points. It was going through the mountain or was skipping over the valley because the one point on this side and one point on that, the distance becoming shorter. Why can't we do that type of things in here where we can review the surrounding documents and there we solved it by, sur by re reviewing the surrounding landscape, learning from it and deciding that, look, this is a mountain, don't miss it. But here we can do the similar type of approaches where we can learn from the surrounding documents and try to fulfill these missed documents. Um, these are challenges um, on offline handwritten documents. Um, handwriting recognition has been going on for many years. I'm not here to discuss excellent methodologies. Already that's an advantage of this approach is we can use those already created methodologies. There are, there has been going on, there's so many public, published papers without any reason why you are doing handwriting recognition. What I'm saying is let us do information retrieval from these documents, otherwise they are get, going to get lost. But in the meantime, you still have to do handwriting recognition. That is the message that we want to pass along. And I'm not going to, I know our time is limited, I'm not going to spend. This is how we look at the words. Again, I'm not going to lecture you on methodologies used in handwriting recognition. This is one of the very basic, already developed methodologies in extracting features from the word. By the way, we are not into OCR or other type of methodologies. We look at the whole word as an image. You can think about it as an English word, American word, or you can look at it as, a, as something drawn by a child, or you can think about it as a landscape. I'm just looking at it as something that is there. And then we come back and say, look, in order for me to, to learn about this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn about features that are involved here. What are the features? Uh, those are, you are new in here. Features are those going to be identity, distinction with factors that we can label these words, and based on that, we can identify them. For example, we call this one a baseline or central line. You scan this document from the top to bottom, as in the image processing you do. As you pick up the long, biggest number of crossover with these color and intensity, I mean, the, let's just call them gray colors or black colors on the intensity side, more num biggest, the largest number of points you cross over, that's going to become your central line. So uh, that's a very simple feature. I can say that I'm going to pick up all the words and go through the center, find the central line, and if they fit into that, let's say there are 20 pixels there, if they fit into that margin, I'm going to say that is this, this, this word that labels this word. And that probably will filter out a lot of words out of the way. And next you can come and say, I'm going to go up 70%. We call these ascending, descending. And then I'm going to put another scan line through. And I'm going to count how many crossovers I have. Here I have two. And here I have two. Then I'm going to say, I'm going to do that for all the words. And I'm going to say that if there are two ascenders, two descenders, most likely that is this word. And this is going to filter out a lot of more of the words. Now, before this was not possible, this is a very processor-intensive work. 
It is slow, it requires a lot, but now we are doing it. We have any memory processing, we have real-time analysis capabilities, and you're gonna see example, we have ourselves have developed this cluster-based system where we can really do, really do a lot of computations that was not otherwise possible before. This is another example of the features. How about the, the points where there is a drastic change in, drastic change in changeovers, crossovers, loops, can you see that? All these are excellent points, can you see that? All these are features that I can label them into the word, and every time I see these, I can point into the words transcribed or text version of the words that most possibly, not. and then we have all these wonderful neural networks, um, and we've done quite a bit of it, and other systems that we can deploy to do all these comparison and the, and the, and the checking for us. Um, and this is part of that loop we were doing at one time. Um, the, the, the segment, the areas of the world that has a loop, how many loop does it have? And based on that, we can label that into the, the world that we can recognize. So this was just a brief, already developed methodology. But what I didn't tell you, how, what algorithms you should use to uh, identify the loops. That is the, that is the focus of our study. Not tell you what algorithm. There are a lot of algorithms. That, that system, that infrastructure I mentioned, that is where the, the researchers are going to have their, all these methodologies available for them, and they're going to be using them um, for others to process, or allowing them others to process their, their work. So we are not here to talk about what algorithm. We are here to tell you how to take advantage of the algorithms and take advantage of the researchers to improve the algorithm or develop new algorithm and give it to us, put it on this infrastructure. This is another one, features. Look at the, it's packed, this world is packed with unique features that doesn't, they don't belong in some others, uh, other area. It has loop, look at that. It has extreme points, can you see that? It has another loop in here, another drastic change or extreme change over. Ascenders, descenders, there is none maybe in here. Ascender, descenders make sense for, for the tail and the head. For example, if you had the edge, it makes more sense there. And so if you can say that if the world doesn't have ascenders, descenders, it falls into this category. You can filter all those that they have ascenders and descenders. Um, these are the current research going on in this field. And I think we should take fully advantage of these uh, to address our problem that we couldn't solve. I think we are getting very close to solving. But then again, our focus is not to produce a product. Our focus is to create, to take advantage or create excuse for researchers to do computer vision research or historians to process their, use our methodologies to produce, process their documents and others. Um, handwriting documents, uh, again, these are some new, new, uh, research that is started happening. Um, I, think, I think it is very encouraging to see that the, everywhere now we look, there's, going to, there's machine learning. Neural network has been there for a long time. We did a major project maybe over 10 years ago uh, uh, under the same topics. Direction for research, um, again, these are some you already know. They are fully... Uh, connected to computer vision. 
And uh, this is something one of my students was working on, um, and, uh, but it really works. The processing, the, the turnover time is so becoming faster. You can do processing that it could have maybe taken long, long time before, or it may pro probably was even impossible to do it before. Um, I did recently ask my students, um, by the way, we are blessed with a lot of high quality and good graduate students, and in my lab there are, I, I think, somewhere around 10, 11 students working uh, with me. And uh, so recently I asked one of the students to look into cognitive computing. Can we take advantage of these tools that they are available? And that when I say tools, I don't mind even to use the tools. For example, you're gonna see in a minute, Amazon Web Services has now got a tool which does a good job in uh, spotting or segmenting the words out. And if it works, why not use that as part of this in infrastructure? And uh, so they did, she looked at few of, of these tools available and she conducted an experiment. Our conclusion you're gonna see that is that is maybe it is true with all available tools. If the document is written in a very nice, clear way, quality of the document, handwritten document is good, they do a pretty good job. But as soon as the document quality deteriorates or um, line slant or other uh, unwanted uh, features starts happening, then we get, they get into trouble. And you can see it very clearly here, um, the amount of, am I done? Okay, okay, so, and these are basically what we did, but the conclusion was none of these systems can handle majority, overwhelming majority of the documents, especially those that they are not really written nice and very clear uh, with a high quality. Uh, and the, this is a current research growth in this area. Uh, we did, um, uh, actually this is pending on, on the review by ACM, uh, a journal on um, journal of, of um, something to do with computing cultural. I can't remember it exactly. But anyway, so this is uh, the trend is is picking up uh, on this, and the, and the sample projects that's going on right now. Very famous one that's going on right now and the, um, some data, data sets that are available for us to use. Very quickly, I want to tell you this. Some of you may say that there are, there are now with um, some libraries, including Library of Congress, they are, they are recruiting or doing crowd sourcing uh, where they are recruiting people online to read and uh, transcribe these documents. Again, there are problems, we believe, and the, someone needs to come back and they check the quality of those transcriptions. Maybe even then, these type of systems we are proposing will be useful for double checking to see if their transcription is accurate. And the, finally, just a few words on the conclusions and the, and the, and the extract of this is Deep learning, machine learning is an opportunity we should take not just to deal with medical imaging as we ourselves are quite heavily involved, but to do on other needed areas that could serve us better. And I'm going to stop here. Uh, I wonder if any of you can tell us whose handwriting is this one? <laughs> Hmm. Okay. George Washington. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, oh awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's give a, uh, a big round of applause for our honorable professor.